We've been in a series called Life is Not Fair. Now what? And uh, we've been following the story of an individual named Joseph who uh, seemed to be drawing the short straw at every turn. Uh, his, uh, his older brothers uh, decided they didn't like him too much, and so they uh, sold him into slavery. And he, he found himself in the home of an Egyptian uh, whose uh, wife became very interested in Joseph and ended up uh, falsely accusing of him of things and ending up in prison. So now he's a slave and now he's unjustly in prison. And there he sat for 13 years. And we've been unpacking that story and his, his response and the way that he handled being uh, uh, in the midst of unfairness in life. And then uh, we watch this dramatic turn of events as God again intervened in a powerful way. And the man went from uh, a dungeon and prison to the pinnacle of authority in all the land of Egypt. He was second only to Pharaoh. And from this position of power and influence, uh, he was able to set in motion a, uh, a food program uh, that would save not only Egypt, but also the surrounding countries uh, because of a great famine that, uh, that was coming upon that area. And so we see Joseph, and we were last week, uh, he's, he was beginning to have some encounters again with, guess who? His big brothers, the same guys who years earlier had sold him off. And uh, his response, and, and, and Aaron did a great job with this point, emphasizing that he, he chose forgiveness and not revenge. Chose forgiveness and not revenge. And as the story continues, they're now at that place where Joseph is prepared to tell them that he is Joseph. They don't even know it yet. They've been having dealings with this Egyptian guy, and they don't even know that he's their brother. And, uh, and it's come to that point in the story where he is going to reveal himself to him as his brother. And we're going to watch this, uh, this scene uh, move from this place of highly dysfunction, highly mysterious, this interaction, to a place of restoration. And that's our, that's our theme this morning. But before we jump in, let's uh, pause for a word of prayer. Father, you are so awesome. And um, it's amazing uh, to us to think that the creator of all things, including us, looks at us knowing us inside and out and says, I love you. You matter to me. And uh, Lord, we take courage of the truth of that as we see that love demonstrated in the lives of others as well as our own and in the life of Joseph whom we are talking about this morning. May you find us to be attentive to your Holy Spirit and that we would have that moment with you as you intend. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the other day I had the uh, garage cleaning job on my to-do list. Anybody else this summer? Garage cleaning, okay, there's four or five, yeah, yeah, it was time, it was time, and uh, we, got it, uh, we got it done, and while I was going through the cleaning, I, I came across this box uh, stuck on the top of a shelf in the corner, and so it's kind of nasty, you know, because garages get that way, and uh, I looked in and I thought, oh, oh my goodness, I'd forgotten all about it. I looked in and I found this. And I thought, wait a minute, that isn't it. Wow. I thought, oh, my fish. At one point in time, this it was a beautiful mount uh, on a piece of driftwood, and it was kind of like this, like they were underwater, you know, and it was just so cool. And then time and kids happened, and uh, they've come under serious disrepair, as you can see. My dad bought me this one. I caught it, and he stuffed it for my 10th birthday present. So it's special to him. So I have this box, and I have these fish, and I still have them. They survived the cleanup. And there's a reason. I have a vision. 
I have a picture in my mind's eye that one of these days when I have more money than I know what to do with, I'm going to take these treasured little fish and go to a taxidermist and say, can you fix these? Can you restore them to their former glory? <laughs> right, you know, and I have this big moment where I go and pick it up and I have this beautiful mount again and can put it up and I don't think my wife's on board with the idea. But it's a dream. And that picture of restoration, of things being returned uh, to a, a state of health and wholeness and strength is, is one we all can understand, can't we? We, we see it all over the place, right? The, uh, we have all the car shows. You see the signs, car show, right? What are we going to do? Well, we, we go there and we look at all these cool old cars that have all been restored. HGTV addicts unite, right? We like to watch the show because we get to see Fixer Up or what were we fixing up? An old house now is beautifully restored, right? And here in our story today, we find uh, this, this call to restoration, and it is uh, truly the message of the Bible from cover to cover. At, at its heart, it's a message of restoration. Uh, it, it, today's story isn't about the restoration uh, of some old fish uh, stuck up in a garage somewhere or, or an old car or, or an old house. It's something far deeper and bigger and more significant to your life and mine. And, and that's the restoration of relationships. You see, Joseph had taken that first step, hadn't he, when he, he chose forgiveness. Huge first step. But restoration hadn't taken place yet, had it? There's still this dangling sentence without a completion to it. And where would it go? Well, it leads us straight in to this chapter today. And we want to unpack it together. Genesis chapter 45, and we'll also... I look at some verses in 46. Again, this is that moment that Joseph uh, is prepared to reveal that this man, this Egyptian they've been talking to, his brothers have been talking to, is actually him. We'll read these first eight verses. Joseph could stand it no longer. There were many people in the room, and he said to his attendants, Out all of you. So he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. And then he broke down and he wept. He wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him. And word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I'm Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them. He said, please. Come closer, he said to them. So they came closer, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. And when he first said it, they were like, what? I, what? And he said, come here. And they got close. Look in my eyes. It's me. The last time we knowingly spoke to one another, I pleaded for my life. And you sold me into slavery. Come, look. It is me. Don't be upset. I bet they were pretty floored at that point, don't you? Don't, don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years. And there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace, and the governor of all of Egypt. And we, we read that and we kind of scratch our heads a little bit. Oh, 
three times. God sent me. God sent me. God sent me. And we say, oh, time, time out. It was the brothers. They were the ones who conspired to sell out their brother initially to want to kill him. It was they are the ones who were responsible for him being a slave. And it was Potiphar and his wife who falsely accused and subsequently falsely imprisoned him and, and put him in that jail without any, any sense of a hope for 13 years. Joseph, what are you saying? It's a pretty intense comment, isn't it? God sent me. Now, uh, we, could, we could go down a whole lot of rabbit trails here at this point. But we're going to stay focused on this. Joseph, above anything else in his life, was, was attentive to the divine. He was attentive to the divine. He was aware of and in tune with the work of God. And so he was an individual who did his life asking the question, God, what are you doing? Where are you working? Where are we headed? What's happening? And along the way, here he is interpreting dreams in the prison. Here he, and giving him, hey, God's working, God's working. He knew, he was always listening and always looking and always attentive to the work of God. So much so that the work of people, even the evil work of people, slid off of his radar screen and his attention, his focus was on the work in the hand of God. We say, wow. What, what does that look like? How, he, he, was, he was living in the reality of, of the promise in Romans 8 where it says that God works all things together for good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Do we believe it or don't we? Joseph did. And he was trusting in the hand of God, and God was moving and working in such a way that there was going to be an incredible good, the saving of many lives, the saving of his own family. This, this picture, this scene of being aware and attentive to God at work is exactly how Jesus revealed how his ministry went. And John, he was telling, he was explaining to people. He says, my father is always at work. That should catch our attention. So if his father, if God is always at work, guess what? He's working today, right now. So the father is always at work. And what did Jesus say as a follow-up to that? He says, I only do what I see my father doing. See, there was an attentiveness in Jesus to the work of the Father. He knew when the Father was at work, and when he saw that, he adjusted his life, and he joined the Father in that work. And so he would be coming into a town, for example, and there would be this little short man climbing up in a tree, desperate just to get a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus would be coming into the town, and he sees this little man up in the tree just trying to see him, and he immediately knows, my father is at work in that man's heart. Or he would not be in that tree hoping to get a glimpse of me. And so what did Jesus do? He adjusted his life. He went right to the tree where the man was. He said, hey, Zacchaeus, i got to be at your house today. Before that story ended, salvation came to that household. Individuals attentive to the work of God, to the, and God is always at work. He hasn't stopped. He's working all around you. Are we attentive to the things of God? Do we recognize it when we see it? Do we connect the movement and conversations and in people and in circumstances to the very prayers that we are praying? Are we, are we spiritually in tune enough to recognize and respond to the voice of God in our lives? Joseph was just such a man to such a degree that he would, under, he would have this view of his story and say that it was God and that I have this place 
of, of position and that God was working in the midst of and in spite of all the evil and treachery that was poured out on my life. He was attentive to the work of God. So much so that what his brothers did to him didn't even count it. He was attentive to the work of God. It's a position of understanding and living life that is very different than the way that the world tells us to do life. We're told be attentive to how you feel and what you want to do. We're not told be attentive to what God is doing. Look, listen, be aware. And in some of the most darkest places in our lives, we'll see the power of God in ways we never have before. We have to be attentive. Story continues. And his brothers are still just slack jawed. I can't believe that this is who is this guy? My brother, and they're looking and they're trying to get their head around it. He says, Now listen, hurry back to my father. Tell him this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me over master over all the land of Egypt. So come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds, everything you own. I'll take care of you there for there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you, your household, and all your animals will starve. So here's Joseph. He's given his brothers this message to give his dad. Come to me immediately! Exclamation point. This, this man who has been separated by the treachery of his brothers for 22 years, their life, both believing or wondering if the one is, is alive and the other believing the other one had been killed. 22 years he hasn't seen his father. And so what is the first thing he wants to tell his brothers to tell him? I want to see my dad. feel that I just want my dad tell him to come immediately and and I'm going to take care of you and that I'll take care of his children well who are his children the same brothers the same brothers that sold him out I'll take care of you and here we see in action something that is extremely rare. And when we get to see it, wow, it, it, it rattles us. Joseph made a decision. Because he, he was headed to this beautiful place of restoration. And in this place of restoration, a decision has to be made. And that is a decision to return good for evil. He was wronged. And, in, and he forgave them, yes, but he did so much more. I'm going to pour good into your life. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you and your families. Yes, you sold me. You, you, were, the, you were the ones who put me in this life of slavery and ended up in the pit of a dungeon. But I'll forgive you, and I'm going to return your evil for good. I'm going to take care of you. When, what's our knee jerk? Someone gossips about us? What do we do? Well, we gossip about them. Somebody hurts us? We look for a way to hurt them back. It's just kind of the way things roll, isn't it? And this idea is so bizarre. What? This person who wronged me, who hurt me, who lied to me, who used me, who abused me, that I would return good? No. Ain't going to happen. Joseph made a decision. I am going to return good in the face of your evil. What about us? See, this beautiful picture of, of restoration, specifically in relationships, 
there is this movement that has to be a part, this flow in life where we are attentive to the divine, that the first and foremost is that life is God-centered, not self, not other-centered. It's God-centered. And there in that place, I am attentive to the work of the Holy Spirit. And there I am in this place, empowered by God to do that which naturally would be very impossible. I don't know about you, but it would be for me. And without the Spirit of God to carry me along, I don't know how I could ever return good for evil. Praise God for his help. And he also helped Joseph. And then we watch. Watch how this unfolds. And Joseph added, Look, you can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that I really am Joseph. It's me. Go, tell my father of my honored position here in Egypt. Describe for him everything you've seen, and then bring my father here quickly want to miss another day weeping let's check this out verse 14 weeping with joy he embraced Benjamin and Benjamin did the same let's catch this scene Benjamin and Joseph are our full brothers same mom same dad Benjamin was just the little guy when 22 years earlier, his brother, the older brother, sold him out. Benjamin was, was his older brother was taken from him. He, he had no part in the betrayal of Joseph. He suffered this great distance and separation from his older brother because of the wickedness of the older brothers too. And here they are. Now both of them know who the other one is and what would little brother and big brother do? <sighs> Fell into each other's arms. And they just wept. Do you feel that? You know what that is? Restoration. It's beautiful. And, and from, from there... After they wept with joy and embraced and, and cried on each other's shoulders, Joseph pulled himself away from his little brother and he faced the other ten. Then Joseph kissed each of his brothers and he wept over them and after that, they began to talk freely. Do you get the scene? There they are. There's just the 12 brothers in the room. He and the younger one torn apart in that sweet embrace. And now Joseph faces all 10 of these brothers. Did he go from youngest to oldest? I don't know. But he went to each one. And he stood face to face with them. And he leaned over. And he kissed them. And he wept. Brother number two. Kissed. And wept. All the way down the line. And then. They felt free. To talk with him. You feel that? It's restoration, and it's beautiful. Oh, but it's not done yet. In Genesis 46, we find that the brothers, they go back. They tell Jacob, their daddy, all that's been going on and all who Joseph is and what he is doing and what he said, come quickly. And they're, they were, he told them all about the, the famine that was going to continue and you've got to come here and I'll take care of you and I'll provide for you. So Jacob with this, you know, he's an old man, you know, and he's, he's, what, my son is alive? Could you imagine? And, and he loads up all the carts and they head into this region of, of Egypt called Goshen where Joseph was going to set up and take, and take care of his family. And as this 
this uh, uh, whole group entered and neared their destination, Jacob, the father, sent Judah, one of the brothers, ahead to meet Joseph and get direction to the region of Goshen. And when they finally arrived there, Joseph prepared his chariot and traveled to Goshen to meet his father, Jacob. And I don't know if, ch if chariots have gears, <laughs> but I'm willing to bet that chariot was in high gear. And those horses hadn't been pushed like that in a while. As this estranged son, rejected by his brother, separated from his daddy all these years, made his way back. Made his way as fast as he could to see his dad. And when he arrived, and I'm kind of thinking he didn't even wait for that chariot to stop. He just jumped out. My dad's here. And, and he ran, he ran to his father, he embraced his father, and he wept, holding him for a long time. He couldn't bear letting him go. And they both reunited father and son in this embrace wept and loved on one another and finally Jacob is able to talk and he says to his son now I'm ready to die since I have seen your face again and know you are still alive restoration and it's beautiful the message from cover to cover is that life together is far better than life apart first and foremost life with God is far better than life separated from God Life with one another and depth of relationship is far better than lives that are splintered and broken. It's far better than having a garage full of relationships shoved up on a shelf somewhere. Deteriorating, even worse. It's far better. It's far better. Life is far better together. Too many families I know, too many people I know living in, in, in relationships of fracture, probably can't even call them a relationship, where the, the vitriol and the hatred is so strong, brother against brother like the story here, you know, sisters, moms, dad and dads, and, and, and moms and daughters, and you know, just, just this horrible scene. And, and anger even at the thought of the person. It is awful. Come to this place of such brokenness. They look at each other and say, you are dead to me. And how horrible it is in being a part of funerals and weddings when there are these kinds of relationships in play. You see, life is far better together than apart. Far better. Now, we can, uh, we can say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm not going to forgive, like we talked about last week. I'm not going to pursue restoration. That's a choice that, in an honest moment, we'll all say that we've made at one time or another. We can make that choice, but what ends up happening is then that the unfairness, the pain of the unfairnesses of life, the pain that comes as a result of others treating us unfair, not only does it not find healing and resolution, but it actually grows and it gets bigger. Or I can choose life together. Can, I, I, I can make choices as far as it's up to me. I understand restoration and reconciliation takes two people. I get that. And so does the word. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But where is my heart? Where is my thinking? Am I attentive 
to the divine in my life? Am I paying attention? Am I, am I at this place where I, I am ready and willing with God's help to return good when evil is extended to me? See, Joseph made a decision. It was sweet reunions that was going to be his focus, not revenge. What, uh, what's our focus and relational challenges in our lives? Mm. Some things that position us well uh, for that restoration really quickly. Um, one of the things I challenge us all the time to consider is when that alarm goes off first thing in the morning, you drop to your knees and you just start crying out to God. In those moments where you're there, in those first five minutes uh, of crying out to God, include a thankfulness. If, if we're here today and we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, and we know that He's gone to prepare a place for us, and that sooner or later we're going to be in the presence of God, not as a stranger, but as a dearly loved child. We know the best is yet to come, and it is always yet to come. And so it is very appropriate in those moments of quiet before God to thank God for what lies ahead in your future. If you keep fixed in your mind the end, when the end being that glorious reunion with Jesus, the, 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 the one who is our good shepherd, who did all to rescue and save us, that there's going to be that moment of sweet reunion. And, and what we know by faith now, we're going to know by sight. Thank God for what's to come. Because when your eyes are on what's to come and you remember and you're thankful, it positions you to be far more attentive on the journey, you see. If I don't have the end in mind, if I'm not thinking about the, the, that day where I am in glory and I am with Him, and he is with me. If I lose sight of that, if I lose sight of heaven, then I get distracted by the things of this life, and I go all over the place, and I don't find myself positioned to seek restoration. I find myself ready to return evil for evil. Hmm. The second thing, as we are talking here in Romans twelve eighteen, uh, Paul made this comment, as far as it is up to you, be at peace with all people. Did you catch that? There's a recognition that it takes two to restore. The brothers were willing and they had repented and they, they had made this, their, their hearts had changed, right? So they were positioned to be able to restore and they did. But as we were talking about that in this scene, all kinds of little faces just popped up above your heads all over this worship center. the Holy Spirit he's alerting you to the reality that there are things unaddressed yet in your life and my challenge and encouragement to you is just take one step as you pray and God shows you that one person ask him to show you what that one step is and trust him enough to take it Knowing full well, you may be rebuffed. But that's their decision, that's not yours. Our decision is to do what God says and what he tells us to do. And if we are to do what we can to be sure we are at peace, just take one step. And, and, and you know, each of us here, we have what I, an, a, a Joseph-type story in our lives. It's a beauty from ashes beauty from ashes type story it's it's this moment where hey this was going on this is where we were and it was horrible and it was miserable and it was frustrating and I was stuck in this and this was going on and didn't see any way out of it and then God moved and it was awesome what he did and he did what he said in accordance with his promise I, I, I work all things together for good and this promise of him doing that is, is both a now and later promise, okay? Sometimes we're going to get to see it like Joseph in its full effect. He got to see the whole thing. This is why. It's God who sent me. He, he, he got to see it all. And you've got to see some of those in your life. And you know what? Somebody needs to hear your story. Were you not encouraged by Joseph's? 
somebody will be encouraged by yours. Tell somebody a beauty from ashes story in your life. And no, hold on tight to the confidence and the truth and the, and the assurance that one day, even if that, was, that ash story follows you to your dying day, at the other end of that moment is the beauty when we stand before God in our welcomed home. Hold fast. Persevere. And the biggest restoration that the Bible speaks about, I already mentioned it, is the restoration of a sinful people with a holy God. See, when at the very beginning of the story, we see that people lived in perfect fellowship with God. There wasn't any distance between them. And then they made a decision to go their own way, and each and every one of us have made the same decision. And the net effect of that is that we're here and, and God's over there and between us is a mountain of sin. All those things that are, that are contradictory to the word and the will of God. All those things that are an offense to him. They stand between us and him. But God in his love wants nothing more than for that relationship to be absolutely restored. So in the face of all the evil of our sin, God did the good. And he sent his son to die on the cross taking the penalty for all that sin, death upon himself, so that now, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, my sin is nailed to the cross of Jesus, it's, and he'll remember it no more, and I enter in to a wonderful relationship with God. It is awesome. Most important decision we'll ever make in life is whether we come to Jesus to have him restore our relationship with our Heavenly Father. If you let Him do that, if you made that decision in your world, do you know who you belong to? Do you know that that ultimate sweet reunion with the Lord Jesus is a part of your future? You can. It's as sure as the empty tomb of Jesus. And it's as sure as all the promises of God. I, uh, over the years... <clears throat> have done a lot of different funerals. Uh, people, people that I know and love, and just God's help get through that. And people I, I didn't know at all, young, old, everywhere in between. And and I can just bear witness to you that there is something substantively different in those moments when there's that confidence that that person knew and loved Jesus. It's a different thing. Uh, that, that confidence th uh, of knowing that they are now engaging in street reunions and in my mind's eye, I think about it every time I'm preparing for a funeral and I think about this person and, and their love for Jesus and, and I just think, oh man, what was that like when they got to see their mom and their dad, saw their spouse again, their child who, who died way too soon? And there's that sweet reunion in glory. Man, I hope and I, I pray with all my heart that all of you know that's a part of your story. That'll be a part of your story too. And that it can be along the way to that realized even in the here and now with those who are still with you. You see, life is better, far better together than apart. And I hope the truth of that becomes your reality. Let's pray.